being our presenter today, and I will hand it off to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia, for the intro. I appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to dialogue with you, so I kind of want to fly through my slides. That's my, I feel like I want to fly through, through my slides so that um, we can talk. So <laughs> I'm kind of excited about that. Um, but um, let's just get started. Um, what I'm hoping to be able to accomplish today is to highlight what I've been working on here in Michigan since 2012, but also tie it more firmly to childhood well-being, to access to social determinants of health, um, and tying it also to healthy outcomes, and, and trying to do that more generally, uh, even though my vehicle is nutrition and physical activity, even though we have a chronic disease goal, which is to reduce or eliminate childhood obesity. Um, I'm just, you know, I've been challenged to expand my thinking around this, um, and so that's where this presentation comes from. So um, I've shared my objectives ahead of time, so um, you've seen these. I'm going to start by kind of giving a bit of information just so you kind of know where I'm coming from, and then I'll kind of get into what I think is more the good stuff. I don't think anyone here with me today needs any convincing about what, why childhood obesity is a concern or why we focus on early childhood for prevention efforts, but I'll talk a little bit about that and define that a little bit. Um, and then again, I'm kind of excited about what I hope will be some dialogue, so I will go as uh, deliberately as possible, but definitely please slow me down if I'm going too fast. So the first thing is uh, I'd like to reinforce always uh, why the urgency, um, and really the urgency and the reason why we focus on early childhood is that we are trying to get ahead of risk factors that children are exposed to even if the chronic condition or disease that we're trying to prevent are not manifesting um, at this particular age. Uh, so that's what's really important here. Many times prevention efforts that are focused on young children, and young children sometimes is defined as birth to five, which is actually the age group for my intervention, and sometimes extends to age eight. But at any rate, early childhood um, prevention many times is by definition primary prevention because we're trying to promote healthy environments and um, build healthy behaviors before any onset of symptoms or any onset of the features of a chronic condition. So we operate based on this case for prevention, but some of us end up having to make this case more regularly than we would like. I mean, it's nice to have the practice, but it is not always, it doesn't always feel good to have to continue to make the case for prevention when decision makers many times want to see something turn around within a time frame a year and a half to two years. But we do, we do do it and there's benefits to verbalizing this case to us because we get in the practice of it and we kind of form a vocabulary around it. So what you see here is a lot, some of the language that we end up using. Uh, we use it pretty frequently, press, press releases and reports and so forth, because we want to keep reinforcing the fact that regardless of what we see, you know, in our anecdotal lives, prevention has a positive effect, even if that effect, the way we define it, it is, is not seen until far off. Uh, one of the ones that are my favorite to talk about within this case is making children better prepared for learning, and that includes attitudes. Uh, and then I have to always remind myself that there are decision makers that speak the language of money, and so they want to hear about how costs might be reduced, whether that be state funding, like general fund type funding, like we have here in Michigan, or whether that be health care. Um, but at any, at any case, there's a case for early childhood prevention generally. And there's a case for early childhood 
prevention of disease and conditions in early child care in particular. And I'll get into that. I want to make, I want to, it feels like I'm stopping, and I think it's because I'm still wrapping my head around this. I had a colleague, I feel like it was like January or February of this year, that came to me to ask me whether Michigan NAPSEC was addressing any social determinants of health. And I was actually very depressed by the question because when she first posed it, my, I felt like the answer was no. I didn't feel like I was deliberately addressing equity issues by improving access to social determinants of health. And of course, the social determinants of health is the context in which we make our health decisions, develop our health behavior, and where our health itself is many times determined. Um, however, when I asked the the more thorough definition, or I shouldn't say more thorough because that, that belies a comparison. Um, the most thorough definition of social determinants of health that I've seen um, is from Healthy People 2020. And they list many features of our context, um, but they do so in a way that's just a little bit more elaborate. And I was able to find where efforts to improve nutrition and physical activity in child care actually does get at social determinants of health. So I felt a little better, but I still acknowledge that I've got work to do. So essentially, I put this slide in here and this piece of this discussion in here so that I can try to paint the picture about how to think about the work that we're doing. Sometimes we're doing grant-funded projects like I am. Sometimes we're starting a new initiative. Sometimes it's a policy that we're trying to advance. But at any rate, trying to make oh, sure you. that we're thinking about Thank you. Th thinking about health in all policies, health equity in all policies, and trying to be deliberate about addressing the context in which health behaviors and outcomes are, are developed. So because NAFSAC, the Nutrition and Physical Activity Self-Assessment for Child Care, is intended to improve food service and access to physical activity opportunities, um, and because children spend so much time in child care when families are handling other aspects of life, NAPSEC can be seen to provide resources to meet daily needs for those children, but also even for the families. If the children don't have a place to be, many times families can't pursue the types of successes that they have their eyes on. NAPSEC improves health literacy primarily through training, including nutrition education. And NAPSEC also provides professional development opportunities, which professional development and training can help someone to improve their socioeconomic condition. So once I had a better picture of what social determinants were, I was able to find, you know, kind of situate NAFSAC in some of these. But I really actually found more reason for improvement than I did to be celebratory about. Um, so I present this, this piece of information just to encourage um, each of you to think about whether your work is um, addressing the context in which health happens in addition to addressing any, any specific risk and addressing conditions direct and head on for early childhood. So now what is the case? It's like, so now, again, talking about this case. So we've talked about the case for early childhood obesity prevention. So many times, especially when I'm talking to child care providers directly, if I'm talking to child care providers themselves, I'm, many of them aren't interested in hearing about NASA because of the subject matter, but I always have a good half of the room that's not quite sure why them, like why are we focused on child care in particular. And the reason is because although a smaller proportion, you could you can make draw a parallel between children under age six and school age children spending most of their time outside of the home and where are they spending it, it's with caregivers and teachers. So nationally, 75% of children 
need some kind of child care service outside of the home. And for Michigan, that number is 65%. That 65% translates to nearly half a million children birth to age six that need some type of child care. So that's, that right there for me is enough for focusing on, child, on the child care setting. Um, but there are, of course, other reasons. I talked about my favorite reason for promoting nutrition and physical activity as having to do with learning. And so you have that here on this slide as well. Another piece of information to know is that when children are in child care, they get most of their daily calories in child care. And that's true for school-aged children as well. So that's more the reason to make sure that that food service is nutritious and meets their nutritional needs. Um, and then last but not least, uh, what, we, what we probably know, even if not intimately through our work, is that child care providers and preschool teachers have a tremendous impact on early childhood development, including the development of healthy habits for life. So the other thing I wanted to share with each of you is a spectrum that I often refer to. It, it was developed by an expert panel that was convened by CDC six years ago. And the intent at the time was to illustrate the state, so at the state level, how different interventions related to child care, related to early childhood programs, if you want to go more generally, might have on children's nutrition and physical activity and even breastfeeding support for moms and babies. And this spectrum is arranged from basically based on reach, and that is from left to right. So you have the greatest reach with licensing regulations, um, and you have, well, with one intervention. So if you had a single intervention related to licensing, you're going to impact more children than a single intervention related to family engagement, as an example. Um, and most of our resources here in Michigan go toward facility-level interventions, and you see that that's right in the middle. And I think that's still the right place as far as reach among the spectrum. Um, but you have a, a tons of early childhood programs and services that are, are that are included in this spectrum. So you have early learning standards, you have technical assistance training, and these are all influencers and levers for early childhood systems. And because they're levers, they're they're the places where we would seek to improve. The spectrum is also, and not coincidentally, um, organized left to right based on the level of impact. So licensing is going to impact at the population level, and family engagement is more interpersonal. It, it's definitely not intended to be arranged or interpreted based on level of importance, because honestly, all of these types of interventions and categories need to be implemented on in a collaborative way with each organization that's leading interventions operating within their realm of influence, within their expertise, and then but working together toward a common goal. And that's really what collective impact is all about. So now we come to the intervention that I in particular uh, implement. The Nutrition and Physical Activity Self-Assessment for Child Care, or NASDAQ, um, is a policy systems and environmental change intervention that includes training opportunities. So it includes kind of community, institutional level um, interactions as well. But it's intended to move child care centers and homes toward expert recommended best practices. And those best practices are specifically in the buckets of nutrition and physical activity, and that includes breastfeeding support. This intervention has components, although I, I, I always hesitate to describe it that way because it's, not, it's more cyclical than it is step by step. But the goals of the intervention are accomplished through self-assessment, goal setting or action planning, 
training and targeted technical support. And I'll come back to how that targeted technical support is um, provided. Our target population was originally defined by the Department of Ed who wanted to, and they wanted to define high need children when they were kicking off the Race to the Top program, which is now in its third round. So we kind of lifted the definition of high need children in order to define our target population, but also with the idea that we would address health disparities in this way. So this particular target population is not so much evolving as there's things that I've learned since using this definition. So it's, for example, the very first bullet identifies <coughs> English learners as among high need children. What is more appropriate to say is dual language learners, because at minimum, young children who are in non-English speaking homes are going to at minimum learn two languages, if not more. So it's more appropriate to say dual language learners. Uh, some other learnings that I've had since defining our target population this way is that um, we, as intentional as I was attempting to be, when I took an examination of the data available in Michigan, which is not, not the best, but we have some data, that tells us about youth behaviors, health behaviors, that tells us about obesity rates. What I was finding is that I was making improper assumptions about how to target our population, but also how to identify priority populations. So there's target and then there's priority. And I will tell you a little bit later in more detail about this, but, we, but I ended up discovering that I was, my assumptions that I was making was, were, was skewing my priority. And um, I definitely intend to pursue solutions to that. I mentioned that this intervention is enabled by targeted technical support. We recruit organizations who can identify NAPSAC consultants that hopefully have experience with supporting child care providers, but even if, all, if their experience is in health education or training, they definitely would um, qualify. Um, the targeted technical support is, at this time, most often provided by local health departments here in Michigan, school districts, and other community-based organizations. And that happens to include Michigan State University Extension in our state. So I, talk, I mentioned collective impact, and I know that that's turning into kind of a jargony term, but we are really trying to leverage some of the philosophies around collective impact, especially the idea of leveraging the, the, the way that certain organizations can influence change. So you want to leverage expertise, and you want to leverage realms of influence where you can. So I mentioned which types of organizations that we recruit NAPSAC consultants from, but I also want to share how different realms within the state, different parts of our early childhood system um, can increase the number of quality child care centers and homes. So for one, we have our QRAS system, which in Michigan is branded Great Start to Quality. Um, it also includes what has, was one time known, child, known as Child Care Resource and Referral. Um, they actually have a community-based infrastructure that exists already, but they also connect child care providers to training and, and professional development opportunities. So we want to leverage that. Local public health, we brought them into the fold because of their health education experience, but also their community-level relationships. Sometimes the community level relationships that they have, that local public health organizations have, is actually with our QRAS system. Sometimes it is with our school district. So that's a perfect connector as well. And then last but not least, the state agencies like myself, we actually monitor the actual system and we're responsible for the infrastructure. So I'm trying to leverage within my power 
our ability to build capacity and provide targeted support for providers. And then, of course, I'm also responsible for monitoring measurement. And in so doing and keeping these kind of relationships thriving, we hope that we can leverage their realm of influence and really boost outcomes in child care. So how are we doing? So this is just specifically related to NASDAQ. I just, I'm only clarifying that because I'm going to talk a little bit about some promising initiatives. But just to pin to NASDAQ, up to this point, we have 375 licensed child care centers and homes who have completed NASDAQ. We do have some unlicensed homes also participating. For our state cohort, so for the providers that I am responsible for, we are recruiting licensed centers and homes because our licensing regulations provide us a baseline for quality. Whereas with an unlicensed home, we don't have a baseline. We don't know what they know. We are getting closer to be able to do that, so then perhaps we will work with any and all providers at, at some point. Um, and then I break down how providers are making their changes. Almost all providers that participate in NAPSAC are able to find a physical activity related change to make. Um, with Head Start, that's usually the case because the regulations they are already adhere to really get them very, very close to nutrition best practice. So they go off and find an opportunity for nutrition changes, but definitely physical activity. And then right behind that are nutrition-related changes. And then finally, breastfeeding support. We definitely want to do some more work on breastfeeding support and getting child care centers and homes to find a reason to support breastfeeding moms and babies, even if those homes and centers don't enroll infants. Because there are ways to support breastfeeding moms and babies, even if your facility or home um, doesn't enroll infants. Because there might be a sibling. Mom might be still nursing for comfort or at bedtime, even if a child is up to five. So we really want to make sure we're supporting breastfeeding moms and babies. So that's kind of how we're doing. I promise to wrap back around to the lesson that I was kind of alluding to. We selected our target population based on a definition of high need children that was provided by the U.S. Department of Ed. And I found an opportunity to refine that definition and I will do that going forward. But I also discovered that the priorities that I had set based on that definition were skewed by some of my assumptions. So one of those assumptions was that all children of color in Michigan had high rates of obesity and overweight when compared to white children, when compared to their white counterparts. And I found that the disparity actually lies among Latino, Latina, and Native children. So more, a little bit more specific. And so I was able to, once I found that data, I'm able to acknowledge that the assumptions I was making about my target population were leading me to choose the wrong priorities. And I also found that we were not in the right communities to impact Latino, Latina, and Native children. So that's something that I am looking for opportunities to correct um, and adjust. Some other health disparities that we hope to be able to impact in Michigan are related to breastfeeding. Breastfeeding exclusivity and even duration is pretty abysmal. With 35% of white mothers and only 20% of black mothers, for example, breastfeeding after three months. The most common reason that mothers stop breastfeeding is they return to work or school. So the only way that we can get at that is to ensure that they are able to get support when they return to work and school, and they may be able to see a reason to continue. The other disparities that we can potentially turn around are related to health behaviors that we're seeing manifesting in black, Latino, Latina youth in middle and high school. So we found that black and Latino youth are 
more likely to develop poor nutrition habits and less likely to have opportunities for adequate age-appropriate levels of physical activity. So we think that if we begin to build the right environment and influence the right habits, that we might be able to start seeing changes once they get to middle school and they're responding to these surveys. So the last thing I wanted to share with you um, after talking to you a little bit about what our efforts have looked like since 2008, even though I didn't say that explicitly, we've actually been working on NAPSEC since 2008. I've been involved since 2012. But there are other promising initiatives that are linked to child care quality and early childhood outcomes um, that are stretching my thinking and stretching my focus. So at the systems level, we recently had the opportunity to recommend changes to our QRIS to improve indicators related to nutrition, physical activity, and breastfeeding support. We don't know yet which of those recommendations will be adopted by our Office of Great Start, but it was an exciting opportunity to do that. Those opportunities don't come up very often. We also may have the opportunity to propose licensing changes. The Child Care and Development Fund regulations are going to force Michigan licensing rules to open for revision, which may also allow the public, which happens to include other state agencies and partners, to make recommendations for licensing changes. So we look forward to that. At the institutional level, we are looking for opportunities to start screening for ACEs, and that could be across the lifespan. So we could be we could screen for ACEs in early childhood in our um, in pediatric medical homes, but also screening for the impact of ACEs in adults with chronic conditions. Um, we also want to look for opportunities to provide trauma-informed services in healthcare. Trauma-informed services could include child care, and one of the opportunities that we are looking at is to present alternatives to suspensions and expulsions in early learning and care programs, so in child care centers and homes, so that children are, so that more children have access to quality child care, because of course, what good is it to improve child care quality if all children don't have access? And on the health care side, we have a federally funded program that is preparing to do a survey to try to understand the social service capacity to provide trauma-informed service. And then last but not least, at the interpersonal and individual level, we're looking for opportunities to improve the ability to provide nutrition education, especially for child care providers. Uh, in many cases, we have children and families covered, um, but for child care providers, we're looking for that. And then also intentional family engagement, which starts with distinguishing family engagement from education and really trying to figure out a way to engage families in improving child care quality and defining child care quality. Families define child care quality based on how comfortable they are with the child care provider when they walk in and whether they feel their child will be safe. They, they define quality very simply uh, and we need to, and that's our charge to respond to them. So that's really the information that I wanted to share this morning and I hope we'll be able to get in some dialogue and please uh, feel free to ask questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Sonia to moderate. Sonia, you may be muted. Okay. There. Uh, and I want to thank um, Lanius very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, anyone who would like to ask a question via chat, I will read it out to the audience. 
and you can also uh, uh, go ahead and uh, <coughs> unmute as well if you would think that you have your question. I have one question from the audience right now, Alanius, which is, do you think that using the Department of Education's definition of high needs children creates opportunities for alignment in the future? Okay, so that was my idea. <laughs> I, I, my idea for using that definition was alignment. The reason I chuckle is that the Department of Ed mm, narrowed is not the right word. They they made the definition more general later. And so, uh, yes, I think that there's still that's still a good idea. And I'm going to continue to utilize the original definition because it lists the categories explicitly, whereas the current definition does not. Um, however, what I've discovered is that as much as I thought it would align, most people don't know what I'm talking about. So that makes me think that it, it's not the way that the Department of Ed talks about high need children, but I haven't been extraordinarily successful in figuring out kind of the language that they use so that it's something familiar to a broader, broader audience. Many people don't have, have never heard of the idea of a definition from the Department of Ed. Um, so again, that was my idea, but I'm not so sure that it's functioning that way at this time. I had a, another question. Um, for the technical support from the uh, local health and school school departments are those an add-on request to their their work projects or has that been an embedded relationship that they acknowledge and are able to actively work on um, I, I, I'm gonna make I, I, I'm trying not to make it complicated because it it's kind of a both end. So in the, the easiest answer to that is that in most cases it's an add-on in the sense that none of the organizations that I am approaching and distributing our RFA to, most, unless, unless they're in my cohort, they haven't implemented an abstract before. So in that case, it's an add-on. But I'm currently working with the local health department that was already working with child care providers on immunization issues, was already supporting them in that and providing training. So in that sense, they were able to embed it in their child care support work. Um, I, you did actually, with that question, though, hit on one of the challenges that we had, uh, which actually is better described as a lesson learned, and that is it is always best to engage with the existing stakeholders and players in a system, no matter how much evidence you have behind your intervention. But one of the things we learned is that, and I'm not saying we went the wrong way, nor am I saying that we would have done things extraordinarily differently if we had connected with the system, but by not connecting with the system when we wanted to expand, it was difficult. And many of the organizations we were approaching were resisting because it just sounded like more work. Um, and so I would just say to, to, to you, to say anyone, I, I try to find the opportunity to say this, that it's really a good idea to um, engage with the current players in any system. Even if you expect complete pushback, even if you're going to implement without them, right? you still need to engage because there's always something you don't know and there's always the, the entry the entry point is almost always better at the beginning when you try to engage and partner than it is trying to repair relationships at the other end. Thank you. I have another uh, question from the audience. How do you specifically address health literacy in your work? Um, it, it, I will say that it, there are probably health literacy experts that would tell me that I'm missing tons of principles 
of health literacy education in the way that we do our work. So I'm going to go ahead and put that disclaimer out there. But the, the, we believe that we're improving health literacy by defining certain terms. So an example, a really key example, is defining nutrition. The reason is that there are brands and companies all calling all manner of things nutritious and healthy, right? Especially related to food. It's just there it's one of those things that people have just begun to use the word to the point where it's jargoning. So one of the ways that we believe we're improving health literacy is for both families and for child care providers, we're defining what nutritious means. So nutritious specifically is based on the content of a meal, the content of the meals throughout a day. So we define it as including whole grains. We define it as including colorful vegetables. We define it as dark and colorful fruits. Um, we define it as lean meat, low sodium. So we try not to use the general terms of healthy and nutritious when we're doing the training. We, we kind of continue to replay the components of healthy meals, the components of healthy diet, um, and I believe that's improving health literacy. I have another question coming in. In your collaboration with early childhood, cent childhood centers, what is your impression of where caregivers fit into the discussion, and what are their requests? Do you feel Knapsack has helped with engagement of parents? Okay, I'll start with the child care providers first uh, in the way I'm interpreting the question. So please, if I if I interpret it wrong, please do let me know. Um, so, child care providers are engaged in all of our decision making um, in our early childhood program. I don't necessarily think that's enough, though. So, the the reason I don't think it's necessarily enough is by volume. Anytime we're making a decision, a child care decision within our early childhood program, it's always by volume more decision makers than child care providers at the table, right? So by sheer numbers, it's already off. And it wouldn't take very much to even the ratio, um, but I haven't seen that happen yet. So there's that. And then the other thing is that when we're engaging child care providers and even families, it ends up being the same old, the same suspect because they're the ones who are available. So I would like to see us do a better job in our state of figuring out a way to reach the mom who's a police officer, to reach the mom who is a factory worker and can't meet at noon. So making things convenient for other families. Well, first of all, doing better about defining what, who a mom is. Um, one of the things that sometimes makes me chuckle is that I'll hear parent coalitions and even breastfeeding coalitions say, um, we we're, we're have a hard time engaging moms and finding moms. And I always ask, well, what's a mom? Isn't a mom anyone raising a child? So if a mom is anyone raising a child, then maybe the question is, when am I having my meeting and can I make it more convenient to more moms so that my organization and my table are more inclusive. Um, and then one other thing I want to elaborate on really quickly um, is the question about whether NAPSAC has helped with engagement of families. That has been our greatest challenge. So NAPSAC has a quote-unquote family engagement component. But the problem is that it's really not. The component is a fam is a indirect family education component. It only includes um, guidance to share information about NAPSAC, nutrition and physical activity. So that's, that's, there's nothing wrong with it, but that's indirect parent education. That's not the same as engagement. So that's why I say that my, our opportunity for change 
within the work that we're doing is to first distinguish education from engagement. And then once we do that, move toward engagement, which means having families to have a say in the decisions being made. I'm going to give a pause and see if there's any uh, further questions from the from the group. It's been a very good conversation so far, and we'll be also providing the sli the slides to everyone, and so people will be able to uh, review review the information. And we do hope that uh, everyone will take advantage of our Mighty Bill community and and take your questions and your dialogue together to Mighty Bill. And so we have talked about maybe the next stage of a question uh, or or topic um, on there as well. So please do look for our outreach and and communications on Mighty Bill. I. Uh, I think that we'll, we'll we'll turn the questions over to Mighty Bell now, and I want to thank you, Lonnie, very much for a wonderful presentation today. And I think uh, we we learned a lot about the Michigan Knapsack program. And so thank you very much, and everyone for joining us. We appreciate your time, and look for our future now webinars coming up, and you'll see that then. Again, thank you so much, and we'll see you at the next one. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.